Evening, Steve. How are you? I'm fine, Tim. How are you? Yeah, it could be worse. We must meet. <laughs> we must meet again on a beach, Steve. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that was cracking, wasn't it? That was a good it evening. Was. It was. <laughs> Lisa, do you think we ought to start? Yes. Yeah, I think we do. Yeah, we should. So, do you want me to crack on? Yes, please. OK, so um, good evening, everybody. Um, and for those that don't know me, my name is Tim Briggs, orthopaedic surgeon at RNOH, and I've um, chaired the GOV programme since inception in about 2012-13. Uh, and it's now become embedded in QI methodology within the NHS in England. What we're doing today is talking to you about the, welcome, about the purpose of the webinar. Um, and um, I'm going to give an introduction about what we're doing with the GERF programme in England. Um, and then we've got a fantastic array of talent who's going to speak to you about what they've achieved uh, and what they've achieved is remarkable uh, and how they can uh, drive things uh, and achieve practice that we then cascade across the NHS as we all try and help with elective recovery. Next slide, please. So the webinar is being recorded and we can share it after afterwards and we'll also circulate the slides. Just ask you to stay on mute if you're not um, speaking. And then we've got, I think, 20 minutes at the end for Q&A session where you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Can you raise your hand using the Teams function uh, and hopefully we'll be able to answer those questions and we can um, uh, and direct them to the right uh, uh, individual. We're also looking at the chat function and we'll reply to all of those messages during the webinar. And if we can't get through it all, we'll send a response to any questions afterwards. So again, very welcome. So this all arose really because um, we were asked through with the GERF programme through the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital whether we would review orthopaedics in Wales and Northern Ireland. And we've done that. We've reviewed all the orthopaedic services across all seven health boards in Wales and the five trusts in Northern Ireland. And what it did, again, using data, data packs and clinical discussions, highlighted unwarranted variation in orthopaedic services. And we were asked to help support and identify opportunities where we could improve, which would help in the short, medium and then long term for elective recovery. We produced national reports with Wales and Northern Ireland, and there is no doubt we are beginning now to see the dial move in terms of recommendations being implemented. And we're now working across Northern Ireland and Wales with other further specialties. And I do believe, I think it's likely that they'll take the whole programme in Northern Ireland and Wales. And why would you not when it's clinically led using data to drive and change practice, which would improve outcomes for patients? Now, everybody knows what the GERF programme is, I think, by now. Um, it's with now uh, 41 specialties, re national reports. It's led by frontline clinicians using data with peer to peer engagement. I think that's the critical piece. It's not being done to, it's showing and reflecting back your data and seeing how what is working well, what's not working well, and how we can improve things both locally, system, and also nationally. What we've also been able to do now across these specialties, very important now we're post COVID, both in elective and UEC, is we now what good looks like for a specialty and pathways. And that allows us to set the standards, to share best practice and knowledge. And I believe these things are going to be critical as we try and restore services across the whole of the NHS. And I really do believe this is achievable. Next slide. So when we started on the elective recovery in England, we started on these six specialties because they represented 63% of patients waiting and 66% of all patients waiting 26 weeks or more and 70% of patients waiting 52 weeks or more. And when you look at Northern Ireland and Wales, it's exactly the same. The numbers are just, it's just that the numbers are different. So we just chose those six specialties. Um, and we made and we produced 29 pathways across those, which um, made up 23 of the total admitted waiting list. And the idea was 
pathway redesign, standardizing pathways across the NHS, uh, and then maximizing our theater productivity uh, and day case rates, and also ensuring that patients that could be treated outside theater what we call right procedure, right place, could be done in procedure rooms and absolutely making sure we improve productivity, efficient paid for, and we set the standards of what we want to see in theatres. Next one. So here are the 29 pathways. And what was amazing was these were achieved in eight weeks. And if you said pre-COVID how long would it take, and it would have probably taken, as I've said before, 29 years. And you can see in orthopedics, we've included spine, six pathways in orthopedics and five spinal pathways and you can see the others around general surgery gynae ent urology and ophthalmology and what we had is we got full support from the colleges and the specialist societies next slide this is an example of the pathway and although we've concentrated on the patient's uh, admission to hospital um, theaters perioptive care and, and then discharge what these pathways allow us to do is to go upstream and downstream um, as we um, move out of this winter into next year. What we'll be doing is looking at the whole of the pathway to make sure the right patients are referred in for the right reason. Next slide, please. Because we now know what good looks like, we've been able to say, well, what are the GERF standards? What, we do, what do we think is the top decile for elective orthopedics? in terms of joint replacement, for example, uh, and other surgical procedures. And you can see here on the rectangle on the right that this is what we wanted to see. But already we now will be changing that. What does top decile look? Really because of all the work that Mary's going to talk to you about at the Nightingale or Swayok in Exeter, where they're setting the new benchmark for arthroplasty of a day. So again, these figures are, are a starting point but they will change. And then on the right hand side, you can see an ICS has done a survey of all its trusts. Um, or you can drill down to trust level to see where they are and where they need to get to and what support they need from the trust to do that. So for me, this is the first time that we've actually had this opportunity to do this. Next one. So what are the stages of elective recovery for us that I think needs to happen across both Wales, Northern Ireland and also in England? We've got mission critical as we go into winter. We're already seeing the issues around the UEC. We know it's going to be tough. But what we want to do is maximise our theatres that currently run. And what we want is what's called a capped theatre utilisation time of 85%, i.e. the two session day. How much of that time is actually spent surgical procedures on patients? We also want to make sure we maximise our day case rates. We've set the HVL standard at, uh, at 90%, but actually across the whole of the BADS directory, it's about 85% is where we want to get to. And I could report that in the NHS in England now, the BADS day case rate is at 80%, the first time it's ever been at that level. So we are moving the dial. I've talked about right procedure, right place. And again, I'm going to go down to Mary's patch, the West Country, down to Ottery St. Mary, just in a different procedure, cystoscopy, where they're doing right procedure in a procedure room, such uh, and it's a one-stop shop under local for patients. And he said, well, how does that apply to orthopedics? Well, just think about some of the minor procedures of foot and ankle, and already we've got guidance on hand surgery, and we can treat those in a similar sort of uh, environment under local, as I said, in procedure rooms. But the key for me is separating the elective and the non-elective site. And I've worked in a, a hub site effect for the ROH for the whole of my uh, consultant career. And I've been very privileged to be able to do that, which means that you can continue to do that work in the winter months and the uh, non-elective does not really impact on that. But we need these hub sites to now work at a different way. Two and a half session days, six days a week, 48 weeks a year. Next one, please. And theatre productivity has got to be at the, at the heart of this. And so before June 2021, in England, only 48% um, of trusts returned any data at all. So in over 50% of trusts, we had no idea what trusts were doing in terms of theatre productivity. Next slide. And so what we can do now, this is a, an example across the northeast in Yorkshire. I present this data every month to their elective recovery board. They've got uh, four systems across northeast of Yorkshire, and we work the CAP theatre touch time utilisation. The the blue light blue dot is the month before. The the dark blue 
um, rectangle is where the bar is where they are this month and the arrow downwards is where we want people to be. So currently before COVID, mm -hmm. what we've got is sit utilization used to be at about 74% to 75%. We now need to jump up to 85% on the right hand side. You can see it by specialty. Next slide. And you can drill down to individual trusts within that region and actually show data that we were never able to show before. And you can see there, there are very few trusts who were hitting where we want to be. And that's the blue arrow that you can see at the top. But some of these, uh, some of the, the theatre productivity and theatre cap utilisations were just nowhere near where we want them to be. And for the first time now, trust can see where they lie in that sort of scheme and there's nothing like showing data to move the dial next one these are the number of cases that we want on list if you look at orthopedics we're aiming to get three acls done in a morning list four bunions uh, two hips two knees and two half knee replacements so double those up for an all-day list and these again have been signed off by the the, the boa the special societies to help drive real change so that's the standard of number of cases you want per list next one day surgery principles all there in the national day surgery delivery pack we worked with the bads group and the center for preventive care this is absolutely fantastic over 200 procedures this is what we should be doing so day surgery should be the, 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 the day surgery should be the default option for all surgery only 15 percent needs to be as an inpatient next one and as I said, hand surgery, uh, uh, right procedure, right place. Um, uh, John Hobby and the Hand Society have really come um, up trumps with the guidance operating outside of main theatres. And we know, therefore, that we can do things in a different way, which frees up our very valuable resource in theatre to deliver the more complex cases. Next one. <laughs> Ring fence beds. Everybody knows the work we've done before COVID in Girth. <laughs> around mm. setting up um <laughs> could someone <laughs> go on mute i assume that's a dog i said i don't know but if go on mute that'd be great but if you look here this is one of the one of the very first hot cold site splits we set up and then just look at the difference after reconfiguration on the cancellations on the day so we know these things can work extremely well next one and what we've got now is we've got in england we've got 92 hub sites that are up and running um, of which 26% are single specialty, either orthopedics and neurology, but a lot of them are multiple specialties. And we've got another 57 coming online and we've produced advi advice and guidance around how you plan them, how you design the layout and how you staff them um, and how we run them in a very, very different way. Next one. And we know from this data that if you have a hub site uh, and the established hubs are in the in the 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 black line there, as opposed to the non-hub. You get a quicker recovery. So the angle um, of the graph and the line is is more angulated, uh, higher, and you also get a better, quicker return to where you ought to be. So we've made the argument, and we know this is the right thing for patients. Next one. And the great thing is, we're now running a pilot, which um, is going to start from the end of November, and we've been inundated with. Uh, hub sites do want to be part of this. We're going to uh, uh, credit them around the patient pathway, staff, clinical governance out, and outcomes, utilisation and productivity, and the facilities of the ring fence. And this is hopefully going to provide two things. One, it's going to provide reassurance that these things are going to be run to a very high standard, and we'll be assessing that and checking on that. But two, also, we want to make the exemplars in terms of outcome. So patients will want to go there, staff will want to go there, and they will become the norm for patients as we ask patients to travel to these hub sites to get their elective surgery. And that's going to be critical. Next one. In terms of outpatients, uh, I think we can help there. So this is a, a slide that is about four weeks out of date, but already the number of the um, number of people now waiting is 7 million, of which the non-admitted RTT is 5.68 million and the admitted is the 1 million. We've talked about how we're going to get through that. But let's put that into the context in where I work in, in England. We see 100 million outpatients a year, of which 65 million are follow up. So if you look at the non-admitted RTT in relation to 100 million, it works out about 2 million 
Um, we're seeing 2 million patients a week. So that 5.68 million equates to three weeks work. If you put it, so it does put things into context, how we could actually do things differently. And also the DNA rate varies from eight to 10%, which is anywhere between eight and 10 million appointments a year. So you can see how the non-emitted um, pathway becomes achievable. Next slide. So if we're seeing 100 million patients a year, of which 35 million are new, therefore 65 million are follow-ups against the non-emitted RTT of 5.85 million. Therefore, there's this huge underbelly of patients that's on a non-RTT pathway that we follow up and follow up and follow up. So we need to do things differently. And this guidance came out last week across 12 specialty services, including orthopedics, on how we should be following up our patients. It's tried to standardise this process so that we um, know that we're giving the patients the best care, but using our resource really carefully so that we can make sure we then look at the non the non-emitted RTT group and we find the slots for them to manage those that are going on to our waiting list that are going to go through our hub sites. Next one. So it's 12 specialties, including orthopedics. Um, and so I think for us orthopedic surgeons, for some of us, it will be doing things in a very different way. And I think we've all been um, uh, uh, conscious of we follow up joint replacements probably too frequently too long. Some people don't now, but there's still people that do that uh, on a regular basis and we need to change the dial. So this came out last week. We got some webinars coming with trainees, the Royal College of Surgeons and Physicians, all the support of the colleges and the special societies. And I think this is going to make a big difference. Next slide. Because if we get this right, it will improve our patient flows in the outpatients. It will mean that what we want to do is it'll improve the patient experience. It'll be better quality of life for clinicians and training and allow us hopefully to get more operating time. In the medium term from January, we want to go upstream to primary care to redesign the whole pathway with GPs, a single point of entry for each system with a, and what we want to achieve is a strike rate of 80%, where currently it's 24%. So the patients we see are patients that need surgery. We get them in in a timely fashion, we treat them, and then we discharge them back. So everybody's a winner, the patient, the clinician, the trust, and the health service. Next one. So that's just an introduction for me about where we've got. And I've just been on calls with um, Wales in the last few weeks, and we're now seeing the development of hub sites in five of the seven health boards. I'm pretty sure we'll have one in the, in the six, and there's just one that we need to do a bit of work for. And I know that in Northern Ireland, we've got Musgrave Park, which is back up and running, uh, much better than it was, but we also wanted the hub site, one in the, uh, one in the west and one in the south, and we'll hear more about that. So can I then just please hand over to Mary Stocker, who's a consultant anaesthetist at Torbay, actually, but what she and her colleagues have achieved at the Southwest Ability Orthopaedic Centre is world class. It's going to set the new standard. And I hope you can all take away a lot of the learning from what Mary's going to tell us. Mary. Thank you. Next slide. Thanks, Ethan. Um, so the background to Swayok is it's based at the Exeter Nightingale Hospital, which was developed um, during the COVID pandemic. It was originally a home base um, at the top and then below it shows you what it looked like during the pandemic. After the pandemic in May 21, the Devon ICS was awarded funding from the accelerator systems to really do something new and innovative for the whole Devon system. Um, so we couldn't re we couldn't put operating theatres within the Nightingale. So we've got two modular operating theatres and a modular primary recovery and theatre store. And then we've reconfigured um, part of the original Nightingale to make the admission, secondary recovery and ward area. Next slide. And what our ambition was was to develop an elective orthopaedic unit, we've got a huge waiting list in Devon, we've really got problems and we needed to do something differently. But we wanted it to be a test of change, somewhere where we could really pioneer and develop new pathways that would change the dial for elective orthopaedic surgery and then use those, use the learning there to move that back into the acute trusts in Devon and across the UK and beyond. Next slide. 
So the really important thing here was we were trying to tackle the backlog initially, but it was an ICS collaboration. So it wasn't just one trust, it was all the trusts in Devon. It was clinically led and we really want to tr transform this system asset into something new and innovative. We wanted to learn from the best and I'll talk a little bit about that and as a result to develop best in class pathways. We really have a vision that arthroplasty surgery for everyone should be ambulatory and I'll talk again about the detail of that. We didn't want it to be another private hospital where you had to be young, slim, fit um, and very special to be allowed there. We wanted to have acceptance criteria that made it appropriate for most of our patients and we have. We've worked really hard to define every aspect of the pathway and I'm really happy to share all our protocols with you. Um, we've got, um, I'll give you the details of our business manager who just will give you access to our Dropbox because I'm really keen that people don't reinvent the wheel. If we've done all the work, for goodness sake, just nick it. Um, so as I said, we're aiming for day or short stay surgery for all. We've started with hip and knee replacement surgery, but we're now um, expanding into other procedures. And one of the key things was having really good patient information so that they know what to expect, because that's half the battle. Next slide. So I said we've learned from excellence. We're really lucky in Devon. We have North Devon, who had the shortest length of stay in the country for inpatient hip and knee replacement. We have South Devon, um, who have been leading the way for day surgery um, for 30 years, really, but who had the highest day case rate for hip and knee replacement surgery. We went up to visit Graham, who you're going to hear from later, who's got absolutely phenomenal day case rates for his knee surgery in his unit. Um, and we went to, or I had been running for many years, um, day case joint replacement um, conferences where Steve and the Warwickshire team have also been lecturing. So we'd, and, you know, Key obviously are the team from Northumberland who've pioneered a lot of this work. So we, we'd learnt from the best units in the country. And what we did was we took the best bits of each of their protocols and built it into something that um, we think is pretty special. Next slide. So I've talked about patient selection and the way we do it is a RAG rating. And this is only a little bit of our, of our RAG rating. But patients who are green, the nurses pre-assess and they can just say, yes, we'll have them. Patients who are in the amber group, the nurses pre-assess and then they'll be put to me or one of my colleagues to look at. And we will see what can we do to enable this patient to come to swear. And the majority of the patients are appropriate for us. The red patients are patients who are likely to need high care postoperatively, and we can't provide that at Swayok. We have no um, HDU facilities. But that's saying we send them to a high risk anaesthetic clinic and they'll sometimes have a cardiopulmonary exercise test as well. If as a result of that, they are deemed to have a less than 1% excess mortality, then we take them to Swayok. So we have operated on a 96 year old lady who went to high risk clinic and was brilliant. So she's good for us. Um, so it's not an absolute exclusion, but they're less likely to be appropriate for us. Next slide. These are our protocols. And as I said, every aspect of the pathway is really tightly protocolized. Um, so we stagger our admissions if for a four joint list, two come in first thing and two at 10 o'clock for a five joint list, three first thing and the other two at 10 o'clock. The later patients have an early breakfast so that they're not feeling all weak and wobbly when we try and mobilise them later. Patients drink water until we send to them for theatre so that they're not dehydrated. We've got standard good analgesia pre-meds and it's all built into our IT system. So the anaesthetist just presses the button um, patient over 70 or patient under 70 and all the analgesia is automatically prescribed. So it encourages people to prescribe according to our protocols. In theatre, four joint lists, some um, surgeons are doing five. As soon as the implants are selected, we phone the ward and the next patient gets changed and the scrub nurse starts scrubbing for the next case. As soon as the surgeon's got needle and thread in their hand, we send for the next patient. And that happens automatically. You don't need to nag someone and say, please send. Patient walks to theatre, we anaesthetise on the theatre table. Short acting spinal anaesthesia, so prilocaine, um, if we know we've got someone like Graham operating, um, if it's a more challenging case or a more junior surgeon or a robot, then we use quarter percent um, racemic bupivacaine for the anaesthetists among you. Um, we warm, we don't sedate our patients, they're told to bring in their um, phones or their iPads or whatever, and we've got headphones and we attach that to the radio if they haven't got their own music. So they listen to music, they're awake. A few patients who are particularly anxious will get a little bit of sedation, but generally it's awake surgery. 
For knee replacements, we use motor sparing blocks. Post-op, they hardly spend any time in primary recovery. We give them a build-up drink, which reduces dizziness in mobilising. This is what's really key. Every single patient goes to secondary recovery. Now, we've got two Nightingale wards, so secondary recovery is just the left-hand side, but every patient comes out on a trolley, not a bed. Whatever time they come out, however old they are, however, whatever their ASA is, their BMI, they, are, they go to secondary recovery on a trolley. And they only stay, they only move across to a bed if by 9 p.m. they've not achieved their discharge criteria. So everyone is assumed to be ambulatory. Everyone is booked as a day case, because if you book someone as an inpatient and send them home on the day, they don't count as a day case. They need to be a management intent of day case. The other really key thing is the physios work till eight o'clock in the evening and the nursing staff are empowered to mobilise. So if a patient hasn't been discharged, the nurses will mobilise them overnight. And by the time the physios come in the morning, they're up, dressed, they've had their breakfast, they've had their first dose of analgesia and they're ready to march up and down the stairs. The other key thing is x-ray. So we do an x-ray, we take them to x-ray as soon as they've hit prime, secondary recovery so that that doesn't delay the discharge because the radiographers leave at half five. So we've got to get them through the x-ray department promptly. Next slide. I'm not going through this. It's in our Dropbox. You can have it. The point of this was to show you every little bit of our, proto of our pathway is protocolised to the nth degree and we really encourage people to follow it. Next slide, please. So outcomes, what did I think we'd have achieved? I'm pretty ambitious, but I got it wrong. I thought that each patient, we've got two theatres, that the first patient on each list would routinely go home. That once we were established and got good, the second patient would go home. That with the wind behind us, very occasionally the third would, and we'd never get the fourth home. So I was aiming for 20% day case rate, 40% home by day one, and the rest home on day two, with a median length of stay of one. I was so wrong. We've had 99% of patients home by day one. Three patients have stayed two days. 60% have been home as day cases. We're getting afternoon patients home routinely as day cases. Some lists, all four joints are going home. Patients done by trainees are going home, even in the afternoon. Next slide. So we've done almost 600 patients. It probably is 600 by now because I wrote this slide a week or so ago. Um, most home, well, pretty well all home by day one, more than half as day cases. And what's most important is really good patient feedback, um, just feedback on the friends and family tests, but also we phone all our patients the following day and we get specific outcome data. Next slide. So this shows you our length of stay. Green is um, day case, orange is one night stay. The little, little pink sliver is the ones that have stayed in more than one night. And again, it shows you for all the procedures. We do primary knees, primary hips. We do robot hips and knees, which drive me to distraction, but I know you surgeons like it. We do partial knees. And for all these procedures, we're doing more as day case than we are as one night stay. Next slide. What about long waits? Well, yes, we are. So in Devon, we've got long waits. So 30% of our patients have waited more than a year. Um, so we are tackling the long waits rather than just, um, you know, it's not a two stream waiting system. We're not just doing the patients who are fit and just gone on the waiting list. Next slide. Um, most of our patients have come from uh, the Royal Devon Nexter. They've got the biggest waiting list and it's our closest hospital. Um, about 25% have come from North Devon and South Devon. And we haven't as yet had patients from Plymouth, but there's um, a little bit of politics around that. Next slide. Again, just to show that we're not just doing slim patients and fit patients. When we started, we did pick some winners for the first week or two. We wanted to get, we wanted to be safe. We wanted to get people confident. So we were picking the more straightforward patients. But as we've opened for longer now, you'll see we've got, you know, almost half of our patients have got BMIs more than 30. Um, a significant sliver have got BMIs more than 40. We're doing AS, most of our patients are ASA2, but we're doing more and more ASA3s as time marches on. Next slide. This is the data from our phone calls afterwards. Um, as, as you can see, you know, I would expect a patient who's had hip and knee replacement to have moderate pain for the first day afterwards, um, but actually well over half have got mild or no pain and very few have got severe pain. We have had a problem with our knees on day three and four, and we're actually changing our protocol to tweak our analgesia um, to manage that. So we're all over our data, 
And when we see a problem, we review it and change things. Um, really important is the satisfaction scores. You know, the patients are feeling good or very good. Next slide. So what next? The key thing for me is that this isn't just about us. We want to lift and shift this model and move it back to our acute trusts in Devon to really revolutionise hip and knee replacement surgery in Devon and get us out of the hole that we're undoubtedly in. That involves changing hearts and minds, which isn't easy. Um, we also need to make sure that our private providers are delivering this standard of care. The patients in the private providers are absolutely the ones that ought to be being day case and one night at the very latest, but actually quite a lot of them are staying longer. There are sometimes agendas to resist change. We all know this. And then the next mission is to try and make this standard practice nationally, which I think we're very much beginning to do. Um, we're quite pleased various people are shortlisting us for awards. The reason I've got to take questions straight after this is I'm scuttling across London in a minute to uh, go to one of the HSJ award ceremonies. So we're, we're quite pleased that our work's beginning to be recognised nationally. Next slide. So what next for us? Um, I said, you know, should we make this the default pathway in our IS providers? I really think we should. Should we make it the default pathway in our NHS providers? I really think we should. The key thing is to plan this pathway for everyone because you'll get surprises. If you second guess that a patient is too old, too frail, too late on the day, too fat, too unfit, um, you won't give them the opportunity to go through this pathway when actually they could have done so put everyone through the same pathway. Next slide. So if you're going to do this, there's a few people who need to do things differently. The surgeons, they've got to make sure that all their patient information reflects this pathway, that all consultations prepare patients for day or one night's day, that they support slick processes in Leah, and that they use a standard protocol for, sorry, slick processes in theatre, and that they use a standard protocol for Leah, and for God's sake, put it in the right place. Next slide. We anaesthetists have to be different as well. We've got to endorse the analgesia protocol and stick to it, embrace short acting spinals, avoid sedation unless you really need it, and adapt, adopt motor sparing blocks, adduct a canal and IPAC for knee replacements. Next slide. Nurses, AHPs, we need consistent messaging. All patients have to be treated via an ambulatory pathway with no exceptions. Nurses have to be empowered to mobilise. Physios need to stay till eight o'clock and we need x-ray on the day of surgery. Next slide. Managers, we need male and female trolley bays in the orthopaedic footprint separated from the bedded area, but it can just be literally across the ward from the bedded area. You need QA4 trolleys that can be used as operating trolleys for knees and that patients can stay on safely for longer. You need your facilities ring fenced. Try and book every patient not requiring high care postoperatively as intended management as day case. And maybe that those patients who do need high care should be length of stay one. Next slide. So the good news is we've written the patient information, we've written the patient videos, we've written all the protocols and we've done the test of change. Next slide. So we're really happy for you to have all that and don't want you to have to redo it. You can tweak it, make it work for you, but for goodness sake, nick it. The benefits are You've got reliable operating if you're less dependent on a bed base, potentially two or three times as many patients through the same bed base. You could therefore get increased income, um, which can fund your physio hours. Um, we, want, we want to establish this pathway across the southwest and across the UK. So you need to think, what would you need to enable you to deliver this? I think it's the final slide now. Oh yeah, so the GERF metrics, you know, Tim and his team have given us some metrics and we're really pleased that we're outperforming them. Um, so we're putting the right um, implants in. Our length of stay um, is well below the GERF, GERF standard for hips and knees. The cancellation rate again is well below the GERF standard and the surgical site infection rate as well. Next slide. Um, I've talked about spread. We're going to adopt some additional procedures, but I think that's not the theme today. So. Next slide. And just really to click through here, just to show these are the teams that have been to visit us. This is the areas that we've already begun to spread the message to. And I think we can end there. Thank you, Lisa. Mary, thanks for that. I think, and I was and just let you know, I was down in Devon, um, I think it was Tuesday uh, for the whole day. And um, what they've done there is phenomenal. And they've achieved, uh, Mary, how long did it take you to 
get this thing whole thing up and running from start to finish a bit longer than it should so we it was first envisaged in june we opened in march the delay um there was some issue around water filters um that delayed us for about six weeks okay so just shows what can be achieved so any questions uh please put your uh, hand up and i'm happy to give those to to mary um any questions well, I'm going to ask a question then until someone puts their hand up. So, Mary, for me, how easy was it to get the uh, anaesthetists on board uh, and also to standardise anaesthetics where everybody feels they need to do something slightly different? Um, and because I see that as a possible issue. And then getting consultant orthopaedic surgeons to agree on protocols, to agree on implants and standardise that. How difficult or easy was it? to change the mindset, if I may ask. I watched Graham laugh as you asked that question. <laughs> um, so I was the Antichrist. I went in and most of the anaesthetists were not from my own hospital. And actually in my own hospital, I think it would have been fine because we're used to working to, together. Um, so, you know, there was lots of arm folding and you're bonkers and you're the Antichrist and this isn't going to work <laughs> and it's not going to happen and it won't work and we're not going to do it and it won't work. Um, and so what I actually did, I said, well, you know, these are the protocols that we believe in, that we've designed, we've developed, but I'm not going to insist that you use it on day one when you're in a new hospital with new ODPs, with anaesthetic machines you've never used before and, you know, feeling a bit, as you know, you've got to be safe. But what I did was I made sure there was a Torbay anaesthetist on site in one of the theatres every day, sticking rigidly to the protocols. And within two days, the physios had said, oh, this is amazing. These patients are mobilising. By the end of the week, all the anaesthetists have switched to the protocols because they'd seen the difference. And none of us want to be the person whose patients feeling ill and got numb legs for six hours and not able to, to mobilise. And what's really interesting is now people are picking up the protocols and they're taking it back to their own hospitals yeah. and they're saying, this is just transformative. This is what we need to do. And I think that's what where you're lucky because, you know, I guess I was a little bit of a maverick. It was all our protocols were based on what Graham's doing and what um, Mike in Northumberland's doing and what Steve's doing. And it was a an amalgam, but it had still never really quite been done like this before. Whereas what you have got is the luxury of saying, actually, this has been done on 600 patients or four 600 patients in Devon and it works. So it's a little bit easier. OK, so uh, I've got Deb Lewis with a hand up and then Thomas White. I'm going to just take a couple of things for the chat. So Deb and then Thomas. Thanks, Tim. Um, thanks, Mary. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm Deb Deku at Swansea Bay. Uh, we've got a bit of an issue at the moment from a, a pre-op -assess pre assessment perspective and the number of patients requiring consultant anaesthetic um, led pre-op assessment. From your triage system, how many are converted across from nurse led into consultant led? Any idea? Um... I probably look at four or five sets of notes a day. Um, we're lucky we're electronic, so I'm really sad I do it in the evening. Um, uh, and in terms of high risk ones, very small. Um, so a couple a week. OK, so much lower than we've got at the moment then. So something to work on. Yes. Thanks. Hey, Thomas. Yeah, again, thanks, Mary. That was that was really interesting. I, I mean, I'm, I'm from. I'm Swansea Bay as well. I'm one of the consultant anaesthetists and clinical lead for one of the, we're trying to set up a hub orthopaedic site. And the biggest issue we have is with the ASA three and four patients, we seem to have a lot, um, a very a, a high number of sick patients. Do you have any of those? Do you have many ASA threes going through? And if so, I can see someone's mentioned it in the chat so far. What cover do you have overnight? And have you had any patients who have had to be transferred out? So we've changed our model and actually we now use a similar model to Swelliox. So initially we thought we would have clinical fellows. We thought it'd be loads of anaesthetic CT three and a half who were stuck waiting for jobs in the new system and we get them. It was really hard to recruit. Um, and so in the meantime, we had locum shifts for senior registrars and consultants. Actually, what we've discovered is it's more cost effective for us to pay consultants to do locum shifts because we only need them after six o'clock in the evening. Whereas clinical fellows, you need eight of them. You need them on a one in eight rotor. Then you've got to find something to do with them for the rest of the time. 
Um, so it wasn't cost effective. So yes, we have senior medical cover at night. They're often intensivists, A&E consultants, respiratory, um, either regis or consultants. That gives us the confidence to push the boundaries and I think is a good thing. And that is a very similar model to that, if I'm not wrong, Tim, that they use in Swelly Yeah. Um, and yes, we are doing ASA 3s. Um, and the key thing there is we put them through an anaesthetic high risk clinic. And if they're deemed to have an excess mortality of less than 1%, then we'll have them. If they need high care facilities, um, and our trigger is if you've got an excess mortality of, of more than 1%, then you're deemed as requiring high care postoperatively. So, and we don't have that, um, so we can't provide that, but it's very few. And the model in Cornwall is 90% or 95% of their patients are deemed appropriate for St Michael's, which is 40 minutes from Truro. Um, and they, you know, they manage it really well. So I think it's, a, it's making it happen yeah. rather than it, using it as a reason that it can't yeah. happen. And Thomas, in, in Truro, what we did is we, we trained up nurses in the ITU at the Royal Truro and then took them uh, across to St Michael's where they ran an enhanced recovery unit. And as a as a consequence of that, they were able to do able to do 95% of patients on their waiting list, and their their transfer out rate, you could count on one hand. So if you get the model right, you pre-assess your patients right, you have enhanced recovery. It doesn't have to be medically led; it can be nurse led. They're trained up right. You can actually run a very efficient, effective, safe service because critically, that's going to be uh, an issue. So, last question for you, Mary, and then I'll let you go to get your dress on. Aruna. Thank you, Mary, for that interesting presentation. You've done an incredible job. Um, just wanted to ask you if you um, do any patients with uh, pacemakers or um, ICDs. So, that's the one. So pacemakers, yes, um, but that's the one group that we would have to exclude is someone with an implantable defibrillator because we don't have the cardiac techs to turn it off and turn it back on again. Um, I guess at a push, we could pull the cardiac tech across from the main site, but then, yeah, they'd be twiddling their thumbs. So I think that's it's a really small group, isn't it? But it's at the moment someone where I would yeah. say no, they need to stay on the main site. And how far uh, is your main site from your? Huh. Depends at the time of day. The wind behind you, 10, 15 minutes drive, rush hour, it would take longer. OK, so Mary, can I just thank you for coming on the call? I think what you've done is inspirational and I hope you are successful tonight, by the way. And good luck. I think everybody sends you um, everybody sends you best wishes for this evening. Thoroughly deserve for what you've done. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. So can I just move on now? We're going we're gonna to hear about SWAT. Uh, and that's going to be led by Paul Saunders. But I see Steve Young is in the background. So is it a double act, uh, uh, Paul, or is it you are leading it? Uh, thanks, Tim. I'm, I'm going to take the lead today. Steve is here to support and answer any questions. Um, I'll um, so say my name is Paul Saunders. Steve, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, I'm Steve Young. I've um, <clears throat> led the uh, enhanced recovery program in Warwick since since the inception 2005, but I kind of oversee it and, and Paul's much more the hands on day to day leader of the program. So he's he's been behind a lot of the innovations that we've done. So he's going to he's going to talk about it. Well, thanks, Steve, and thank you for inviting us. Um, so uh, the first question we always get asked when we talk about the SWAT team is, well, what does SWAT stand for? Uh, and unfortunately, it doesn't stand for special weapons and tactics. Although we could certainly do with some with some of the patients that we get. Um, SWAT stands for our South Warwickshire Accelerated Transfer Team. Um, it's a program that, as Steve mentioned, has been established since 2005. Um, in terms of our performance, which is what we're mostly going to touch on today, um, in terms of length of stay, for many years now we've achieved low length of stay across the board. So this is length of stay for primary hip replacements, which includes all our cohorts. So this is every patient that comes through. Um, the department. The blue line is our own performance. The top line is the average um, across the NHS and the uh, horizontal line is the um, GERFD benchmark. So as you can see for, for quite a while now we've sat underneath that. Um, and for us the main reason we achieve that is because we've created a norm within the department um, and across the whole um, program and journey for the patient of trying to aim for that day one discharge. So five years ago, 
that sort of norm and culture was around the day two discharge. And then with a few innovations, what we've been able to do is really drive day one discharge as the norm. Um, so 70% of our hips and our uni knees will be home on day one, and it's over 50% of our total knees currently are achieving the same thing. Oh, next slide, please. Uh, so everyone on here will be aware of this um, graphic and, and what this really stands for. The reason we've put this on here, which is your sort of typical arthroplasty pathway, albeit it's optimistic in terms of its duration and timeline at the moment in terms of an 18 week wait. Um, but what we wanted to represent here is that the biggest graphic or the biggest arrow relates to your preoperative time. So it's working with the patients throughout the journey. Um, your inpatient time quite often is one of the shortest journeys that you get or time spans with patients. Um, next slide, please. So if we take this on to where SWAT established back in 2005, and if we can just click again, uh, SWAT was a team in essence at that point, a team of physios and nurses that visited patients in their own home following the first few days after discharge. Um, and this was very much about taking an expected sort of six, seven day length of stay down to a two, three day length of stay. So we had clinicians visit patients in their own home to continue that care. Next slide, please. And click again. So what this slide is really demonstrating, um, and if we have another click, is that the SWAT program, as we now refer to it as, is involved throughout the pathway. And the key things really are about making sure that we're making the best use of the time and engaging the patients so that they are well prepared. They are expecting what we're expecting of them and they know what we um, are expecting from them and their families. We introduced a couple of years ago what we called an onboarding call, uh, where as soon as the patients have gone onto the list, we make contact with the patients either with an individual phone call or through a virtual lecture where we really set the scene about what the program is going to mean, what they need to do. Um, and at that point, we set the scene that most patients will go home the day after surgery. And really, it's about engaging the family and their support to make sure that those things are in place to allow that to happen. We have multiple means of education. So we have videos, we have booklets. Um, and importantly, again, in the last few years, we've made a lot of our visits from our sort of orthopedic specialists before the surgery happens. So for example, if a patient's got dementia, we'll often visit them at home to get a bit of a baseline as to what their norm is so that we know that we can confidently and safely discharge them um, the following day after surgery and minimize the trauma to them. We work very closely as an MDT. Um, so we meet the week before a list of patients come in. So we meet every Monday and we'll talk through what we need to do as an MDT, whether that's the pain nurse specialist, whether that's the physios on the ward or the nurses, about trying to make sure everybody's prepared for every single patient to achieve what we set as the uh, estimated discharge day. We have an early mobilization emphasis. And just like Mary alluded to, the key to achieving that is not leaving it down to just your physio team because there's only so many of them. So we refer to it as blurring the lines between professions. Nurses will often be the first person that gets a patient out of bed, as will HCAs, whether that be mobilising patients just to have a sit out for an hour early postoperatively so that we can drip feed their mobility, drip feed their um, physio sessions, not to exhaust them and risk sort of shattering them all in one go. We are very lucky to have consistent protocols from consultants. Um, and all in all, what this meant is that our aftercare side of things has been able to reduce in its sheer quantity. We do a lot more now by virtual calls and videos, um, but we as a team take emphasis on continuing the care for patients from an orthopedic unit. They stay under the consultant here at the hospital for the first six weeks after their operation. So we go out to visit patients, we remove clips, progress their physiotherapy, and we cook a lot of that in-house. Uh, next slide, please. So although not everybody's program will be able to look the same because it's dependent on the individual in, um, environment for each trust, what we believe are there are key principles. Um, starting from the top and going clockwise, preparation, as I mentioned, we believe is key. Driving a day one um, norm, a sort of culture around getting patients home day one being the norm. Um, engaging patients and their families as early as possible. 
Um, we believe in an MDT approach, which is sort of common across everywhere. However, what we're sort of mo moving more towards is an MDT working pattern, whereby it's one profession, not just working as a collective team, but one profession adopting the roles of different um, and responsibilities for different professions. Um, senior level leadership is so important, and I can't stress this enough. Um, it, it, being honest, on the shop floor, things have been tough over the last year, 18 months. And I think Mr. Young's involvement particularly isn't so much in the sort of legwork and the groundwork, which I get the fortunate honour to do. It's in making sure that everybody feels supported um, and that we're all working towards the same goal. So, um, like I say, just engaging your teams, whether it be the ward team, the pre-op team, the theatre team, um, that senior level leadership is really important. Uh, the final point, which is data collection, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Uh, this is and has been for a long time here at um, South Warwickshire, a, a real key emphasis of our programme. We believe the programme that we've had since 2005 has evolved to what it is today based on the data we collect and, and acting on where we see improvements can happen. So, for example, we collect data as an MDT. We discuss it as MDT why every patient stayed in every day. So why there was this patient not going home day zero? We get an MDT decision on that. And when we start to see common trends, we look to influence that by putting in new actions to stop this. We review all of our readmissions and complications. Um, collecting data is, is fantastic, um, but what staff and the team need to see is, is how that data is then used to, to create change. So we hold, again, an MDT, anaesthetists, consultants, pain team, pre-op, bookings, um, attend a bi-monthly meeting where we review our own performance and we review the data to see again where we need to initiate change to continue to improve because for a long time what we've known is if you stand still you go backwards. Uh, next slide please. Um, so I'm just very briefly going to touch on our sort of um, day case um, pathway. We have a very modest day case pathway in, in, in um, consideration to other departments. Um, and we do run our day case service currently through our main orthopaedic ward. One, because it, um, it, it, it capacity wise, it's what we can do. Um, and second, it's where we have the specialists that we believe can make this work and get the buy in across the department. Um, our length of stay performance was good, say four or five years ago. Um, and since the introduction of the day case pathway, it's really driven um, further improvements. So it's not just that direct impact of having a day case surgery on getting patients home day zero, but it drives improvements, we believe, across the board. Next slide, please. Um, if you are moving towards starting a day case pathway, um, we strongly encourage you to have an established enhanced recovery program for patients because this does create the culture. Um, as was discussed before, selecting patients for day case is important, but it isn't and doesn't need to be as strict as the fittest, the youngest, the slimmest. Um, and that really becomes um, an evolution of your programme then, rather than trying to rewrite the whole thing from the start. As mentioned, um, by running our day case service through our main ward, we have seen improvements across the board, even in patients who don't go home. Um, so even if your day case service is modest, for example, like ours, we still believe there's a huge impact that it can play. Uh, next slide. Uh, so finances. Um, so this is always a tricky one to describe. Um, ultimately, the staff that are employed directly under the SWAT team banner, which is an elective orthopaedic um, budget, is um, around 275k a year. Um, it consists, most of that funding comes for staff, along with a few cars and some equipment. Um, and back in the day, back in 2005, this was very, very easy to justify by saving three or four days on length of stay, the equivalent of visiting someone at home versus keeping them in hospital, the finances quickly and easily added up. As time's gone on, I think our justification for continuing the SWAT program, as I say, we now refer to it as, is improving productivity, reducing late cancellations, um, reducing readmissions and understanding why readmissions occur. Um, and also, as I mentioned, we do keep a very close eye on our patients. We want them to come back to us if we feel there's any issues. And by doing that, we're confident that we're reducing inappropriate use of analgesia um, and inappropriate prescription of antibiotics um, when they're managed more in the community. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so 
Um, I appreciate this has been a bit of a whistle stop tour of what we refer to as our SWAT program, but Gerf have very kindly um, put this in much more detail. Um, so on their best practice uh, library online, there is a, a lecture that was given by both myself and Mr. Young, um, and also um, a delivery guide and a template for looking at length of stay. And that relates to the MDT meeting that we have about choosing reasons why these things happen. Uh, final slide. So in summary, um, we believe the key principles across any enhanced recovery programme remain the same. We believe it's about creating a culture and not just describing a textbook. Each unit needs to have a programme that's unique um, to its own circumstances and that by collecting data and reviewing those local circumstances, programmes will evolve to continue to drive improved performance. Thank you for listening. Paul, oh, thank you very much indeed for that. And um, um, we'll be able to ask questions at the end. So can I move on to um, Graham Walsh, orthopaedic surgeon, um, and he's going to tell us how we can use digital to enhance day case uh, knee replacement pathway. Graham, over to you. OK, thanks, Tim. So basically, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, the day case pathway we've developed up in Calder and Huddersfield. And I'm going to kind of give a digital edge. Um, part of my role when I was um, originally started this was I was a CCIO, so there was a kind of a focus on how we could bring digital into healthcare. So next slide. So why did we want to start day case surgery? Um, we when we started off as part of enhanced recovery, um, we saw that patients could go home on day one or two, and they seemed very comfortable. I think the teams grew in confidence that actually same day discharge was possible. So we we originally started our, our protocol as an ad hoc basis. As we saw patients were going home and they were going home safely, we formalised the pathway. And what we did, we added the digital section. And the digital bit I'm going to talk about mainly today is a wearable technology. Um, and we used this technology to bring it into the uh, NHS Trust. And this was a really nice collaborative approach with the local independent hospital, with the Trust and Lucala, who's um, was our, one of our main kind of MSK providers. So next slide. So it was a collaborative work, as I say, um, you know, the key to anything digital is involve the digital team early, you know, get all the tick boxes, the IG and everything else uh, signed off very quickly. Uh, most digital now has the DTAX and everything else attached to them, so it's much easier to have those conversations. You know, we had a significant input from Bron, who made the wearable sensor. It was a very new technology. Um, it didn't work very well at the beginning, and we worked with them to, 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 to iron out those faults and make it better for patients. For us, it was huge. Usually this team were hugely enthusiastic. You know, the staff wanted this, they could see the benefits for patients. And you know, and it's testament to the fact that from the the, the first idea of um, a wearable technology to the first patients going home, it only took six weeks to set this up. So I think it was a really testament to the team. So next slide. So this was kind of the protocol that we've come to. Uh, you know, this will be on the slide, so you can look at that if you've got a spare um, time and want to go to sleep. Um, but if we move on to the next slide. So how's it start? Well, it starts obviously with the outpatient consultation. You know, we have a very simple inclusion and exclusion criteria. I think Mary's alluded to the fact that most people are suitable for day cases. We introduce the concept to patients. You know, it, uh, when we first started, it was novel. It's now in our area, the, the norm. Um, you know, and I think the key to this, the success of any pathway is dependent on the whole team. Everybody has to be involved. Everybody has to be encouraged to have a voice and everybody has to believe the message because anybody along that pathway, it could even be the cleaner that says to the patient, oh, I wouldn't go home. So everybody has to buy into this and we really make that important. If a patient is suitable, they enter a preoperative uh, bespoke pathway. And, and again, along the pathway, everybody is empowered. If they don't feel the patient suitable for day case, they, they can come off the, the pathway. Pathway. And I think that's really important. So next slide. So these are the exclusion criteria we started off with. If I'm honest now, the only one that really matters really is the top one, uh, if a patient lives alone. I think most of the others, um, patients can be managed as a day case with the right input, but lives alone is one of those that I think you, you do need somebody there overnight, at least on the first day. So that, that for us is the hard stop if a patient goes home. So next slide. Yep. So 
Yep, so we we have a one-stop pre-assessment clinic, which I think is really useful. We bring together the physiotherapists, the occupational therapy teams. With the digital technology, we introduce it at this stage. There's no point in introducing an app or a wearable on the day of surgery. A patient's going to be in pain, they're going to be confused, they're going to be stressed. Bring it in before so they can use it preoperatively. Number one, that has a knock-on effect of making, you know, pre-op, the, um, they can do their exercises in a better position with surgery, but it means you iron out any complications. So patients are, you know, are much better afterwards and much more compliant with the technology. And we give them information and not just about the technology, about the pathway and about day case. And I think Mary alluded to that earlier. Information is the king to, to getting people home and giving them the empowerment. You know, we make sure that patient feels as much of the team as all the staff. You know, give them the education, give them the motivation. That's really what will deliver deliver day case. So next slide. So the day of surgery is largely the same. Um, you know, we use you know, high functioning joint replacements. However, we now, you know, we can do day case revisions. We do day case unis and we do day case totals and we don't differentiate between any of those surgeries. I use uh, still a tourniquet um you know i think we you know we talk about non non-use of tourniquet to reduce some of the the pain post-op but we found that reducing the tourniquet pressure reduces the thigh pain but it also gives you a, a kind of surgical feel that's safer i've used the term reproducible th theater flow and i think what i mean by that is the team has to work together regularly they have to understand each other you know, if 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 you have a surgeon, that one minute's taking an hour to do a knee, the next minute taking two hours, it's not going to be as suitable for a consistent day case pathway. I use a waterproof dressing and no woman crepes. Um, this allows people to view the wound. It allows a patient to shower. There's nothing worse than after an operation having that bettered in smell. Um, you know, you can go home, you can shower, you can kind of, you know, feel more normal after the operation. And then again, you know, what we try and do is normalise the experience for the patient. If the patient patient feels it's been a minor operation, they're much more likely to recover well. And the other thing is, you know, and, uh, you know, and I think, the, the, you know, we do not use drains. We do not use one and crate postoperatively. They almost act as an anchor to the patient. So removing those will allow your patients to, to rehabilitate quicker with the physios when they get back to the ward. So next slide. So I'm, I'm, you know, most of the, uh, as a surgeon, most of these words I can't even pronounce. However, you know, the the anaesthetic protocol is, as Mary alluded to earlier, is very strict. Um, you know, we we follow a, a enhanced protocol. We get the patients um, fasted. Um, or sorry, well hydrated for theatre, they can drink up until theatre. We use an infiltration, and again, um, that's really important. You get the infiltration in the right place. One of the problems, you know, we don't we don't use blocks but blocks are something that you know people can use and it doesn't it doesn't stop a patient going home with a, uh, as a day case and what we do is we get give them the therapy the normal therapy that they would get they get it in a shorter period of time and i think that's really important so we don't cut corners with the day case pathway they still get the same input they would do and it's really important to give the patients post-operative phone calls uh, so next slide and again, they go home with almost a kind of prescriptive set of analgesia. We send them home actually with with drug cards, so the patient gets the medication when you know not when they're in pain, but when we feel is the right time. And this has worked really well. And we also have a stepwise progression. If a patient needs more input, they will ring the hospital, will ring them, and they can move on to a different pain pathway. So we have different analgesics set up uh, uh, along the pathway. And if we go to the next slide. What you'll see is this is the information we give to the patient, really simple stuff that they can make sure they're getting the right analgesia at the right time. So if we move on to the next slide. And this is important, we have a nurse led discharge. You know, the nurse is empowered and the physios are empowered to decide when that patient's safe. They follow a, a, a series of, um, of, of tick boxes and once they're happy, a patient can be discharged. They're not waiting for the surgeon to discharge a patient quite often. By the time I finish my list, the first three patients on the list have already gone home. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it really does work that way. Uh, so next slide. So the wearable technology, this is about digital. How does it enhance the pathway? It sets a, a, a set of exercises that patients can um, do daily. It gives them um, very easily self-management. They've got control of these pathways. 
They can log um, any discomfort postoperatively. The physios can remotely review the compliance and see how the patient's progressing. And that's really important because they can see remotely which patients they have to focus on. A lot of the patients have discovered they don't need any input for it at all, and therefore the, they just need to, to focus on those that need their support. People love the ability, and patients love the ability that they can message the therapy services it doesn't take much time for the therapy services, but it saves a huge amount of time for the patients who would normally have to ring secretaries and, you know, and, and spend a lot of time going to GPs, you know, and that has been a real benefit. But what patients feedback is the, the ability to monitor their progress really does enhance their recovery postoperatively. So next slide. You know, we use virtual follow-up where we can. Um, we use uh, a company from the States called Andor that integrates with Microsoft Teams, making the experience much easier for the patients. You know, the, the, the you can pull in the x-rays into uh, the conversation. You can pull other people into the conversation. So at follow-up, you can have the physios in the same virtual room as a patient. You can have relatives, you know, people to encourage. And, you know, it's a, it's a much better way, you know, with the wearable technology, you know how well the patient's doing. So you don't bring need to bring them back to the room to see how much their knees flexing. And uh, next slide. So this is the combined results. This is, you know, this is a little bit outdated. It's a few weeks old, but essentially we've done about 304 cases now on our day case pathway. Uh, 21 of these were using the digital wearable um, in its trial. A lot of the the other patients are now using the wearable as well. Um, Again, we don't differentiate between the surgery. A lot of these were, were revisions. We've done 12 revisions and eight complex patients as day cases, and they've done really well. If we move on to the next slide, um, the average time for discharge is around 11 hours. Um, you know, from the end of surgery, it's about seven hours. I tend to do six joints in a list, although we now have a, an enhanced utilization pathway where we're doing eight joints. Um, and we can probably, on a, uh, on a six patient list, easily get the first three to four home. Um, we've now we, we now safely feel that a patient that's getting back to the ward between 2.30 and 3 in the afternoon with the right physio can still go home the same day. Um, and again, the, the early phone call, very similar to what Mary said, most of it was for pain and occasionally, um, you know, there was nausea. But they have the, the protocols that we give them and the prescriptive analgesia, um, so we can, we can, we can treat um, that effectively with them remaining at home. So next slide. I'm speaking fast because I'm conscious of time. Um, so these are, you know, not many complications. You know, one of the dressings that we use is is the uh, Prineo dressing, which uh, does cause some blistering when you first use it. And that was one of the complications we saw. I kind of learned how to use it and then it stopped happening, which was really important. I have unfortunately had one uh, super, um, superficial infection that was only um, a few weeks ago. It needed a DARE procedure at 10 days. That patient subsequently done very well. Um, next slide. Um, and, and this, you know, this, this, I think this is really important because this shows what happened pre-COVID and what happened post-COVID. Pre-COVID, we had a day case rate of around 35%. Uh, over the same period post-COVID, without a single change to the protocol, that went up to 56%. And I think that what tells me is that people's attitudes have changed. People want to go home. We haven't changed anything, but they are going home sooner because they want to. And I think that, you know, I think that this slide really does say a lot, you know, about how the world has changed post-COVID. So next slide. So here we go. This is probably the important bit. What did digital bring? Did it bring anything? Well, actually, I think it did. You know, we had pretty good compliance for mo from an app and a wearable technology. You know, postoperatively, 62% um, was daily compliance. We found that actually, the more that you complied with the wearable, the better your outcomes. Um, the other thing we saw, which I think is really interesting, you know, there are still surgeons, I believe, around this country that um, that still insist on a patient having nine degrees of flexion before discharge, and that is delaying in discharge you know but what we found is actually with the wearables as soon as the patient goes home their their range of mo movement drops significantly down to i think you know you know in, in our study it was it was down to an average of 54 degrees but what we saw is incrementally over the next seven weeks that will increase and i think that's really important is that we shouldn't use range of motion as a as a criteria to stop discharge progression of range of motion yes but not as a you know not a set period about 90. and what did we find with the wearables we found that actually the, the more you used it the be better movement you had um the better movement was in in, in uh, was associated with better compliance you know and patients just seem to do better so next slide 
from a therapy service, it reduced the amount of input that the physios needed. You know, they were doing six home visits pre-using the wearable. After the wearable, they reduced that down to only a, a couple of visits. And in fact, now they're pretty much visiting very few patients because they don't need to, because the wearable, you know, they, they've got the confidence with that. Purely financially, just over this very, you know, the, the very small pilot, you know, there was already a, a significant saving to, to therapy services. Um, next slide. You know, to the trust, they could reduce bed days. You know, the, the cost, you know, the average length of stay at the time at Calderdale was 3.6 days. You know, even if they only reduced that by one day using the technology, it would make a huge cost saving. But more importantly, it would free up beds. And I think the other thing as well, we, we found, you know, it, it, it's, it's relevant to say that we did find a CO2 uh, saving as well. And, it, you know, significant. And when we looked at that with the short length of stays, reduction in people's uh, patients travel to and from outpatients, that is, had a significant benefit as well. Uh, so next slide. And the patient loved it and they generally did love the ability to monitor their progress. You know, they didn't feel alone. They felt somebody was with them, you know, and I think that made a big difference. Often people see day case surgery uh, as 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 you're pushing a patient out of hospital. It, it's it's the opposite. They become part of the team. They're being monitored. And I think that was a really important thing for the patients. You know, they messaged the physios. In this study, there was 209 messages that were sent, which seems a lot, but for the physio's perspective, it took them an extra five minutes every morning to log onto the dashboard and have a little look. They were worried it was going to take a lot longer, but I think what it did, it, you know, it, it 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 didn't really add to their you know daily toil, and I think it you know it could be used in any unit. Um, next slide. Um, and you know these are some of the feedback patients loved it you know it was you know majority of them liked it um you know it felt again they felt supported and that's really important the patients felt supported um and if we go to the next slide now this would have been a video of 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 this patient saying how how happy he was and well he's done and the next slide as well is another video but uh, we're not going to play that in 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 respect to the time but if we move to the next slide this is the this this patient here he was one of the, one of the first that we used with the um and this was him back um coaching uh, rugby at school at three weeks post-operatively and he had a partial knee so you know it shows how you can speed up recovery potentially using this and it also shows that day case surgery you know if you can get back to doing stuff like this at three weeks you know it, it's it's certainly associated with good outcomes uh, next slide so what are the benefits of digital well improve patient satisfaction that you know that's a given patients were so much happier you know the patient takes ownership of the care potentially the technology would deliver better outcomes you know that's a longer term goal but i think it's certainly achievable i think mary's already showed that actually you can develop an ambulatory arthroplasty unit i'm kind of sitting up in cold and i'm very jealous of, of the work they've done down there because you know it's fantastic you know what, what they've achieved um, you know, and, and again, it brings care closer to home, you know, reduces unnecessary hospital visits. You know, as surgeons, we think a patient needs to come back and see us to say how good they've done and bring us a bottle of wine. The reality is patients don't want to come to hospital. They want, you know, they don't want to spend hours parking, you know, and it does improve, you know, if, uh, patient um, outcomes on that respect. It reduces the overall cost of care. The key to this is reproducible. Nothing that we do or nothing that um, they do in Devon is 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 clever. It's really simple. It's reproducible. Share the, you know, we like to share what we've done. And, you know, any of these pathways can be used by anyone and introduced. Um, you know, and I think that is a really important message that you'll hear time and time again. You know, day case isn't something clever that the surgeon or anaesthetist does. It's it's the it's the team approach and it's how the team works together to deliver this. Uh, so next slide. And I think the you know the next bit where can we go with technology? Technology is around us. You know, technology can feed every aspect of the whole pathway. It can go into triage at the beginning. Does a patient need to see a GP? No, they can go onto an online portal and be triaged. You know, it can help them with education and self-care. You know, it can help them communicate with its PIFU problems, its PREM data. You know, you can look at the whole flow management, the operational efficiency. You can automate processes and remote patient monitoring. So there's a huge amount of work we can do with the technology and we can use that to enhance the both the pathway and the outcomes for our patients. And I think it's important that, you know, we, we start having these conversations because actually the technology will help us reduce some of those contact points for the patient, which ultimately will allow us to, you know, to, to Tim's point earlier, to see more patients that need to be seen rather than following up patients unnecessarily uh, longer term. 
So I think that brings us to the end and hopefully I've kept to time. Um, so Graham, thanks a lot. And um, I think that's going to generate quite a lot of discussion actually when we get through to the uh, the panel piece. So um, great. So um, I want us to keep, keep us on time. So can we talk, um, have a talk with Safita and Aruna regarding elective enhanced care, which has been developed for surgical patients at West Hearts Teaching Hospitals. Um, so who's starting? Your, whoever is, are you on mute? Aruna, I think you're on mute. Hi, um, uh, I'm that's Dr. Better. Aruna. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Uh, I'm the clinical director for anesthesia at West Hearts. Can I have the first slide, please? Or the next one? Um, just a little bit about our circumstances and our uh, setup. Uh, West Hearts Teaching Hospital has three sites. Watford is the acute site, St. Albans is the elective site, um, and Hem and Hempstead is the cold site. There are the um, theatres at Hem and Hempstead Hospital. Uh, the trust provides catchment area of about half a million people, and uh, there are lots of changes uh, that we're going through. Uh, we are going through to extensive refurbishment, which will soon start uh, mainly on Watford site. Uh, next slide, please. So the enhanced care supports the delivery of holistic, high quality care for surgical patients who are, um, are at increased risk of having adverse outcomes. So these are the patients we're talking about who need either a lot more observations that cannot be provided on surgical wards or interventions uh, that cannot be provided on normal surgical wards, but they don't actually need to go to um, intensive care units. So the objective, next slide please. The objective was to deliver high risk patients um, electively at, uh, deliver high risk patient operations electively at uh, St. Albans City Hospital without compromising patient safety. Um, we also wanted to reduce the uh, RTT uh, for our uh, procedures, and there were a lot of bed pressures on uh, Watford site, so we wanted to increase the throughput to the St. Albans elective site. Next slide, please. So the way we define the enhanced care patients, well, these were the patients who needed a little bit monitoring and more support compared to what they would get on the wards, or they needed some more interventions to stop them from going into organ failure or deteriorating, or some of them needed some organ support of, uh, of uh, a kind. Um, we limited ourselves to one organ support mostly. Um, or they needed some um, increased observation and monitoring or intervention and outreach um, support from an outreach nurse. So the way we started off is initially, we used to send all ASA one or two patients on SASH site, and most of the ASA three and patients would go to Watford site. When we looked into uh, this, we realized that the patients or three patients who went to Watford site, hardly any went on to go to HDU or ICU. In a whole year, there were only five patients or less than five patients who went to intensive care unit. And then we realized that we don't actually need intensive care unit or HDU for these patients. And they can be managed with a little bit extra care on our elective site. Can I have the next slide, please? I think that's the wrong one. Um, can I have the next one, please? The methodology. Okay, um, we'll go back. I'll talk about this first. Um, so we having a matron at Satch who was the ex-ICU matron uh, was actually quite instrumental in uh, driving this uh, enhanced, recur enhanced care uh, program on Satch site. So, the, the team that we gathered together was pre-operative assessment uh, matron, 
and purely lead anesthetic lead and um, orthopedic lead, the matron at SACH and the ICU matron to provide us with the outreach service. Once we formed the tree, uh, we, once we formed the team, we ran a pilot project at SACH with a small cohort of orthopedic patients. After the success of the pilot project, we uh, wrote a business case to uh, put enhanced care patients through um, such site. We had traffic light system, again, which was described before as red, green, and amber. The red uh, the patients were not going to such um, site at all. The green ones were okay to go through such, and the amber ones were chosen as our enhanced care patients. Initially, we saw all enhanced care patients uh, face to face. They were seen by consultant anesthetists um, in POA clinics and um, they were assessed. After about six to eight months, we realized that all of them don't need to be seen in POA clinics, but we selected a few to see them in POA clinics face to face. The, the area or a bay was isolated on one of the post op wards uh, for enhanced care patients, and they had additional monitoring, which we accepted patients with arterial lines, we accept, accepted patients who needed CPAP due to sleep apnea at night. We accepted patients who needed um, some inotropic support, such as peripheral metraminal infusions and high flow nasal oxygen. Um, we had between, between 8 o'clock at night to 8 o'clock the next day morning, we had an outreach nurse looking after these patients. Um, and during the day, between eight o'clock um, uh, in the morning till eight o'clock at night, our theaters were open and we dedicated um, a theater anesthetist um, to go and solve our problems uh, for these enhanced care patients. We don't have any support still on the weekend, so we do not do any enhanced care patients on uh, weekends. We did them on uh, up to Thursday only, Monday to Thursday. There were usually um, two to four patients every day, and they were either first on the morning list or first on the afternoon list. The program was started initially pre-pandemic, but we had to stop and it was restarted in November 2021. So we're coming up to one year now, and we're rolling out to other specialties from orthopedic surgery. So this is a very busy slide, but to give you uh, an idea, Last month, in October 2022, we had 27 patients go through enhanced care, and 33 were out, out of them were orthopedics, um, two breast surgery, one upper GI, and one uh, gynae patient. We are hoping to do a lot more cases in the future. We are hoping to get the number up to 30 to 32 per month, uh, which is um, 10 to 12 per week and um, roll out to other specialties such as urology um, and surgery, general surgery too. So the governance, can I have the next slide please? So um, an SOP was written for such enhanced care patients. An elective enhanced care audit tool was formulated uh, by the SACH anesthetic lead. Enhanced, um, care patient working group was formulated for monitoring and compliance and the enhanced care working group meet every monthly and they feed back to the theater productivity uh, and efficiency group um, and to the transfer group. We haven't transferred any patients um, in the month of October. Um, we have rarely transferred any patients to our acute site in the past um, and this uh, this actually uh, ties up with the trust uh, clinical uh, uh, program to, uh, put, uh, to increase throughput through uh, the such site. Thank you. So thank you very, very much indeed for that. And again, I look forward to um, discussing this in the in the discussion. So lastly, can I ask, um, um, we now hear from Andy Dunn, who I know very well, orthopedic surgeon, helping with the GERF programme. And Andy's going to talk about collaborative working, how you do it across the region, Andy. Okay, 
thanks, uh, Tim. So, uh, yeah, next slide, please, um, Lisa. So we've heard GERFT is about moving the dial, um, and that's about using uh, data. And we're really lucky as orthopedic surgeons because we've got a lot of data. The you know model health system is you know fantastic, and yeah, you know, I had one of our SCPs um, chatting to me in theatre you know yesterday between cases. And Tim will love this saying, you know, I absolutely love model health system. It's absolutely fantastic. Her and her consultant are doing um, lots of work on um, trying to move as much uh, more complex foot and ankle surgery, hind foot fusions, subtalar fusions to, to day case um, you know, surgery. And I'm hoping Tim will get to hear all about that when he comes to visit us in a couple of weeks. But it's really important that both we as individual surgeons and our clinical teams that we work in, you know, use this data to move the dial. So next slide, please. So when Tim came to visit us back in 2014, it seems a long time ago now, um, you know, I had looked at my sort of, uh, you know, data and I thought, well, OK, well, yeah, it's, it's not really where I want it to be. And why was that? So next slide, please. So. So I was one of those uh, surgeons that, you know, Tim knows all about who was doing around 10 or 15 year uni knees a year. But actually, when I looked at our report, I had two colleagues uh, who were much better at them than me. They were high volume uni surgeons. And I thought, uh, you know, being reasonably self-aware that actually, you know, if a um, you know, member of staff or, a, um, you know, somebody I know in and around Barry Stebbins came to me needing a uni, Am I the best person to do it? And the answer was no. So what did I do? I started referring those patients to my colleagues who are outliers on the joint registry. Um, they get out some of the best results in the country. Um, and next slide, please. And as a result, I moved the dial and my knee data, uh, you know, is now improved. So I just do total knees and, uh, you know, my uh, revision rate is around two standard deviations below the mean. So it's about moving the dial as individuals, we discuss our annual NJL report with our colleagues. It's a very sort of supportive conversation. There's no finger pointing goes on. It's about, you know, looking at opportunities to use the data to drive improvement and move the dial, which is what we all should be doing. So next slide, please. So since May of last year, um, I've been privileged to work with the East of England team and we've got a fantastic um, you know, setup. We work very closely with uh, Tim and his colleagues at the uh, you know, national um, you know, GERV team um, and um, really are on board with the HVLC uh, you know, program. So in terms of our structure, we have a regional strategic group meeting which meets you know, once a month. Uh, that's uh, for uh, senior operational uh, colleagues, uh, AHP leads and all our systems, uh, orthopedic uh, surgeons and um, clinical director level and clinical lead level. So it's a really multidisciplinary group. And what we're trying to do is get colleagues to, you know, use the model health system data, build relationships both across the systems they work in, but across the region. So we're getting you know, clinicians and operational colleagues, you know, to work together to really deliver the improvements for our patients that we, we need. We have an orthopaedic surgery working group and, and Simon uh, West is on the call and he's a member of that. So each of our ICSs has a, a, a clinical lead for orthopaedics, but again, to share information more widely, um, we, we've opened that up to our, you know, clinical leads as well to uh, get those conversations going about uh, provide a collaboration about system-wide, um, you know, working implant rationalization that, you know, are really, really uh, important. And we've got an um, MSK network with um, primary care colleagues, AHP, uh, secondary care, uh, because as Tim, you know, described in his talk, um, clearly there's been a lot of focus on what we're doing in secondary care, but unless we are going to manage the demand and make sure that orthopedic surgeons seeing the patients that they really need to see, we really need to transfer the front end of the pathway as well. Uh, we've got, you know, a governance system in place and I'll share that briefly with you, but the, the data is absolutely key. So we encourage all our teams to use model health system to look at their metrics. We provide them with a bit of support and help. So we've put a reason we've put a regional dashboard together using SPC charts because I think if teams can see um, that they've got, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, common cause variation that's improving, then that's really positive and far more positive than these red, amber, green charts that we all used to use. And we've got a regional leadership team, uh, which, um, you know, I've described. But our, our culture, like with um, 
the NGR conversation I was telling you about is very much uh, about openness. It's about transparency. It's about, you know, being supportive um, and, you know, using um, uh, and sharing, you know, best practice and identifying opportunities for improvement using the GERF methodology. So next slide, please. So our structure here, um, I'm not going to uh, uh, shed, um, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you can see, um, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a big region, 6 million patients, huge geographical area with six systems and 13 acute providers. The, uh, that sort of, it all feeds back into our regional leadership, you know, team and Tim uh, comes on a monthly basis to talk to the acute planned care task force and share some of the uh, GERF matrix and HVL LC metrics with the senior leaders in the region. Um, so, you know, they're certainly cited on, uh, you know, the work that we're doing. So next slide, please. So this is our dashboard. Um, and uh, again, there's all our systems, all our acute providers on that. And uh, very few, uh, I mean, this is back in August, there's no patients, I think, in the East of England now waiting more than two years for surgery. But I think what's really encouraging is when you look at the number of patients that are waiting 78 weeks, uh, the uh, SPC charts are showing that all those, um, you know, trusts apart from, uh, uh, you know, one are showing a uh, special cause variation that's improving. Um, and we've got obviously um, other sort of metrics in terms of uh, activity levels, uh, outpatients, obviously, as Tim's mentioned, that's a really important, uh, you know, part of, um, you know, what we're all trying to do. Uh, Theatre productivity, which is key. So we want, you know, all our, um, you know, providers um, having cap utilization of 85, uh, you know, percent delivering four joints on list um, and also, uh, you know, working on their length of stay as well. Uh, but even though we put the dashboard together for them, we're really, really encouraging to, uh, encouraging to use the model health system, which is fantastic. So next slide, please. And so what have we done? So one of our uh, trusts, um, they were doing uh, two joints and one minor uh, knee arthroscopy on an all day list. Um, late starts, early finishes, um, they have patients being pre-assessed seven to 10 days before surgery, high day of surgery cancellation rates and, and not great theatre utilisation. So we um, set up some uh, weekly four joints per list uh, task and finish group meetings with them together with our regional colleagues and, and some of Tim's colleagues on the national GERF team, we reviewed the whole pathway, which is really, really important. So we've heard how important, um, you know, optimising, you know, pre-assessments um, and, uh, you know, making sure the patients are, are fit for surgery. We um, visited the hospital um, uh, in, in August um, and uh, spent time um, on their elective ward, um, spent time with the team in, uh, you know, theatre, um, had some, um, you know, good conversations using that data um, to start a conversation really and uh, and then explore that and you know they're now delivering four to five joints on a list so it's absolutely you know fantastic improvement not only for the team there but for their patients in uh, in their in their system so it's been you know very positive uh, next slide please so then in terms of other opportunities so uh, again this is um, the sort of uh, orthopedic surgery front page on model health system uh, of one of our trusts and um, if you click on the uh, the gateway metrics um, next slide please that provides a bit more information about um, you know some of their orthopedic uh, you know metrics here and what we're particularly interested in is, is length of stay. So, for example, operational colleagues will know that in terms of your RTT trajectory, the two things that make the biggest difference to that trajectory are protecting your ring fence beds and also decreasing your length of stay. Because if you have shorter length of stay, you need fewer beds to run your elective service um, and it makes it you know, really lean. So clearly we can see that um, this uh, you know, trust has issues for length of stay for primary hips and knees. So next slide, please. Um, so we can see that the length of stay for hips is third highest in the country, highest in the, in the region. Uh, next slide, please. But the brilliant thing about model health system is that it allows you to sort of benchmark um, uh, you know and compare yourself to other organizations and obviously we can see all the trusts um, on the left hand side and uh, I mean uh, Mary's data is obviously better than the data that's um, you know shown here and that probably is because it includes some of the patients 
Istanbul complex being done at the RD and the NE. But as a result of um, the relationships, you know, we've built uh, across the region and across the country, uh, the team from Harlow um, are taking a multidisciplinary team of surgeons and ESIS. Uh, I think their coup is going along, you know, with them because it's really important that you get exec support, um, you know, with these uh, improvements that you're trying to, uh, you know, make. They've got the therapies team, they've got the ward manager for the elective ward going down, and they're going to go down and, and um, see Mary and the team. And I think the, the great thing about orthopedic surgery is um, it's a fairly small world. A lot of us know each other and units that are doing great work, as you heard this evening, are just really, really keen to share that with, with everybody. So next slide, please. So in my own uh, hospital, um, we have uh, an issue with uh, uh, length of stay for hip and knee replacements, and that's for a whole uh, you know, variety of reasons. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Um, and for hip replacements, that's 4.8 days. Now, you know, I know spending a lot of time on model health system, which maybe I shouldn't uh, you know, admit to, but uh, I, I do like it. So this the, the, the second uh, green bar from the left is Northumbria that you've heard mentioned tonight and Mike Reed and his team run a fantastic, uh, you know, programme up there. They've got the second lowest length of stay for hip replacements in the country. And next slide, please. And they are the lowest, uh, they have the lowest length of stay in the country for uh, knee replacements, whereas, you know, ours, there is an opportunity for improvement. So next slide, please. So I'm uh, met Mike um, before COVID when he was running the Quiz Collaborative, which our uh, organisation you know joined, and that was looking at reducing infection joint replacements and developing a standardised perioperative anemia pathway. Northumbria have a really good good track record with quality improvement, and you know that's embedded throughout their whole organisation through you know finance, you know clinical teams. It really is you know very impressive, and so we. The team up to um, Exum. Mike, um, you know, does a really good job of hosting that. Um, there's a very good B and B. You stay in near Hexham um, on a Sunday evening. You he does a presentation with his team. You know, organises a dinner for you, and then you go and visit the hub in Hexham. Uh, you know, the following day, and 20% of um, the patients in Northumbria go home day zero. Everyone else goes home the following day. And like we were saying with the Harlow visit, take a multidisciplinary team with you. So everybody that's involved in that patient's journey um, you know, on the pathway can see firsthand what the benefits are. So as a result of that, we've now got a weekly task and finish group um, which during August and September. We've done 145 uh, total hips, total knees, and our length of stay for hips has come down to 3.1 days. Length of stay for knees is 2.3 days. We're not quite, um, you know, uh, where Graham and, and, and Mary are, but, you know, we're, we're getting there. And I think um, as Tim, you know, Mentioned the game changer for us will be um, maybe getting we're still very GA heavy and what we need to really do is move the dial uh, with our anaesthetic team and uh, really you know get them uh, using the short acting spinals that you know Mary and Graham's team use so well. So uh, next slide please. So finally we've got another piece of work to do uh, in another trust so uh, you can see that on the left uh, this particular surgeon um, isn't working, uh, you know, that effectively. So he's doing one revision hip replacement, an all-day list, starting operating at 20 past 10 in the morning and, uh, you know, finishing at two o'clock um, and not really doing anything else. Um, I think, uh, you know, when you're doing peer-to-peer -peer review um, and when you're visiting other hospitals, not only have you got to be able to talk the talk, you've got to walk the walk as well. Um, I regularly deliver four joints on a list. I teach on, you know, two of them because we've heard a lot about elective recovery, but actually it's really important that we focus on educational recovery as well because, you know, we've all had a very difficult time during COVID. The trainees have had a really difficult time as well. I think that with the, with the hub sites, when they come online, they'll be able to fill their logbooks. And I think that the hubs will be, you know, a massive, um, you know, a benefit for the, for the trainees. Um, but, um, you know, we are um, doing our huddle between 8 and 8, 8 15, sending for the first patient at 8 o'clock, often getting knife to skin before 9. Um, you know, sometimes we'll work through lunch, but I always ask the team what they want to do. Um, my uh, registrar will do two cases, I'll do two. I'll do things like, um, you know, close up for them because actually what the trainees want to do is set the patient up 
do the approach, you know, put the implant, uh, you know, in place um, and that saves 10 to 15 minutes. And, you know, if that keeps my team happy at the end of the day, so that we start on time, finish on time, having done a good day's work, then, you know, that's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. But we're um, planning to go and visit the sort of system uh, where we have got issues with uh, some theatre productivity, uh, but again, combination of regional colleagues, um, you know, some of Tim's um, colleagues who have a huge amount of experience, again, looking at a whole theatre pathway. Um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know how we get on. So uh, that's it from me. Thank you. So again, Andy, thanks much indeed. So first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who's presented for uh, sticking to time and the quality and the content of all the um, presentations uh, and we will be sharing the slide deck. I think that's critical because what we've got to do is got to get all the learning out there. What we don't want to do is have to relearn stuff, have loads of committees setting up action plans because we've got to go past that. And what we've got to learn is who's done it well and just and just deliver it. So um, the panel is here. If people would like to put their hands up, um, to ask a question and if not I will pick some people I can see in front of me to comment and possibly ask a question. So Gavin great to hear you great to see you from Northern Ireland what would you like to ask the, who would you like to ask and what's the question? I'd like to ask a general question to the whole panel so we're talking about single joint stay case short length of stay one of the things that we're building in the service is bilateral joint bilateral same day joint replacements what are your thoughts on how that fits in with uh, same day discharge or day one discharge? Or do you find that by uh, by having very, very short lengths of stay, what you're doing is sending the patient home, bringing them back very quickly for the second joint? I'm interested just, just to hear, but it's, it's, a, it's a growth, it's an area of growth for us. That's a great question. So I'm going to ask Graham, uh, your, your experience in, in um, up at um, Huddersfield and Calderdale, and then Andy, can, can I ask you to comment on that? So, um, Graham, what's your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I personally um, don't do bilaterals. Um, I'm purely knees. And what I find is a lot of patients, when you've done one knee, they often come back and never actually have the second joint done. So there is that argument. One of my worries with doing bilaterals is 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 the very fact that you know, the recovery is the key to success for a joint replacement. And those first few weeks are those important few weeks. And I think if you do bilateral uh, joint replacement, the patient will be struggling and therefore uh, my worry and you know is that the patient may not do as well um from an outcome perspective and a satisfaction perspective could you do day case bilateral knees i think the patients would struggle because i think it would be a you know it may be a bridge too far the surgery you know we use short acting spinals you know this they, they wear off after after an hour and a half you know, so uh, the surgical time will be extended. You'd have to use um, different analgesics. You'd have to use a different way of anaesthetizing the patient, which I think would probably jeopardize your ability to deliver that as 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 a day case. So that would be my thoughts. Um, you know, both. You know, one is yes, I'm not convinced that bilateral surgery is the way forward anyway. But the other thing is, I don't think you can deliver bilateral surgery necessarily as a day case safely. OK, can I ask Andy to comment and then Steve, can I ask your comment? Can I get your comments on it? Yeah. Yeah, Tim, I'm aligned with Graham over the last 20 years. I've uh, not done any uh, bilateral, um, you know, uh, total knees. Um, I had a colleague used to do quite a few and I see the patients for a second opinion and they all said the same thing, you know, after uh, you know the operation, I felt like I didn't have a good leg to stand on. Um, so I find the way to get the most predictable outcome is, as Graham described, you know, do them, um, you know, uh, uh, separately. I think, the, you know, the slight concern is obviously with some waiting times in some parts of the country, that's not as uh, timely as we like. Um, you know, my population, I have a lot of uh, fairly stoical, uh, you know, farmers, um, and um, I think that they come back for their sort of six week check, 50% um, of them will say, yeah, well, I'm going to have the other one done. 50% will say, um, you know, no, I'm, I'll let, let's leave it. I, I still can't predict which patients are going to go for this sort of second side. So, uh, yeah, I think and I think Graham's point about, you know, if we are moving to more short acting spinals, then I, I think it may be a step too far. But I'll, I'll let Steve come in. So, Steve, we've just heard from the knee perspective. You're a hit man. What do you think from day case bilateral hip replacement? 
Yeah, I'm a, I'm a keen, well, I'm keen on bilateral surgery. I think um, tranexamic acids probably made a huge difference in, in making it safe for surgery. Um, we accept that it won't be a day case, so the spinals can have um, some fentanyl or whatever put in um, so that they we know they're going to stay overnight. Um, but I think it makes mobilisation actually easier for them rather than having one good leg and one bad leg. Um, it does make it more difficult for a couple of days, but I still think a target of the next day to get them home is reasonable. And even if it means they slip into another day, I'd accept that because I think the benefits of, of doing both at the same time are, are good. And I think it's safe surgery and probably tranexamic acid has been the, the sort of game changer for that. OK, and can I ask Aruna, what, what's your anaesthetic take on that? And then maybe Simon, you could com comment as well. So what's your view on that, Aruna? So Aruna's had to go because she's actually... Oh. Paul and was in theatre, Tim. So, Simon, um, what's your thoughts on that? So, I I think there is a place for bilateral surgery. There are specific patients that require, as Steve said, it does make mobilisation. They've got one good hit, one bad hit. It can be bad. And certainly from my experiences in uh, doing Operation Walk Island, actually, Gavin, uh, in Vietnam, we do, we do a couple of bilateral knee surgeries there because they get very severe fixed flexion deformities. They come very, very late for surgery. Um, and if you've got one knee that's straight and one knee that's bent at 25 degrees, it's very hard to get around. So I do think it has a place. I think I'd agree with the comments previously raised from the point of view of um, the anaesthetic side. Um, they do require a longer anaesthesia. They do require spine, a longer spinal. And the experiences that I've seen are that they, they end up staying a bit longer. So whether you can bring it into same day surgery, I think you're really pushing the envelope as there, as Graham has said. I think you're just going to have to accept that maybe less than 24 hours stay, as Steve has said, um, but they're going to stay a little bit longer. So, Gavin, I take from that, that's pushing the envelope is what I would say. Do you want to come back? Yeah, it is, it is pushing the envelope. When you're talking about uh, just the, the same in the last the point you made at the end about seeing patients in Vietnam at the minute, we're sitting at our RTT would be between uh, 48 and 52 months. So that's that. You know, these are the patients we were operating on. We're on a waiting list before COVID started. Yeah. But when COVID, COVID was COVID was a, a twinkle in somebody's eye back <laughs> then. So you know, they, they've waited. They've waited so long. Uh, I think the other thing that I would take from it is is maybe hips good and knees bad. Uh, so you might actually, if you're talking about bilaterals, you, you've got a separation there. And, mm -hmm. and certainly, I mean, we all we all know, you know, you operate in the hip and the pain is gone, and 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 that's it. I find that less so with. Less so with knees. The knees are the knees are a bit sore. You know, the knees know that they have to recover, and hips don't because it just they forget they forget they ever had arthritis. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Iona, Kurtz from I think you're Betsy, aren't you? Yeah, Bengo. Yeah. yeah, excellent talks throughout. Very inspirational. That's what I first wanted to mention. And then a question towards um, Andrew. Um, one slide you put up about the starting times initially and then um, how you improved to cut the starting time down by an hour 20, initially starting off 10.21 and then going down to starting off at 9 and finishing similar, cutting it by extending it to two hours. What do you think are the most important things that could it, could be achieved? So I think from a on a clinical director of surgery at the hospital, from a job planning perspective, I think it's getting your anaesthetic job plans and your surgical job plans aligned. So all our surgeons, all our anaesthetists get paid, they get paid 2.5 PAs for an all day list, 1.25 PAs for a half day list. So um, that is my strong point, but to me that's either 7.30 or 5.30 or it's 8 until 6. And, uh, you know, I think um, it's um, about, and I, and I think, what, what we do know is that, you know, in uh, in organisations, and I think this is where, again, the hub sites will, will really help, is that if you've got the same anaesthetist and the same surgeon working together on a regular basis, that makes a big, um, you know, difference. Um, and I think also it, it's, it, it's sort of... Um, you know, as we've said, not just sort of talking the talk, but, you know, walking the walk, you know, we, we've got to kind of lead, um, you know, that. 
um, you know, make sure we turn up, um, you know, on time, start our huddles, um, uh, you know, early. Um, and, uh, you know, Stella Vig, um, some of you may know, is absolutely, you know, passionate about this. You know, she, she said that, you know, it's vital that we're starting on time, you know, and finishing on time so everybody can go home on time particularly our theatre staff because um you know we may do one operate one all day operating list in the theatre complex a week they're there five six days a week and if everybody's overrunning it's just not you know fair so i think it's that you know it's that you know team approach it's aligning um you know job plans i think there are some sort of process things so i think as mary described her idea of um, getting the ward, sorry, getting the theatre team to phone the ward, check the patients ready when the implant size has been selected. You mm. know, all these things kind of help, but you, you know, you've you've got to look at the whole, um, you know, pathway. Um, you know, really. Yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. So, uh, can I ask? Uh, there's no hands up. So, Paul, can I ask you? So, if we're going to uh, encourage people to adopt a lot of what we've discussed tonight, which I think demonstrates what can be achieved. And I've always liked the SWAT model. And um, I met, it, um, well, I've known Steve many, many years, and I know he's been doing it since 2005. Now, if you're going to encourage um, in Northern Ireland or one of the health boards in Wales to, to set this up, mm -hmm. and we need to do it at pace, what's mm -hmm. the key things you need to do? Um, I think that the sort of common themes that have gone through every talk is um, engaging all of the team, getting everybody on board right from the start. Um, for us, it was achieved by instilling one team with one main focus. Um, so again, the day case has been really, really well presented today. And I think by trying to implement a day case protocol or a day one target protocol, it draws everybody in, it gets everybody thinking about the same thing. Um, and the influence isn't just, as we say, in that, that small cohort that achieved day case or day one, it's by engaging the whole team and bringing them all in to a single focus. So for example, our day case pathway, far modest compared to everybody else's, but it actually had a significant impact on our program and our length of stay across the board. Um, so I say, find, a, find a, a focus to go on and day case is a great one, um, and then bring the rest of the team in with you to focus on that. Thank you, right, Simon. Yeah, I was, I was going to pick up on the from the enhanced care perspective. I mean, Aruna probably didn't bring, bring across how utterly challenging it was to get engagements from her colleagues. Um, she's a very large department. She's got uh, 38 consultants and another 20 staff grade doctors. There's quite a lot of resistance to this enhanced care pathway at the onset. Um, and it was a significant amount of investment by the organisation in making it work because the RTT was, was really quite bad. This is pre-COVID. Um, and we had quite bad RTT figures there. And it, there was, we, you had to, we had to get some champions uh, and we got two of, two of our anaesthetists to champion it as enhanced care leads for the St Albans site. And we got one surgeon uh, to, be, to be, Neil was the enhanced care lead from an orthopedic perspective. And we focused it in one area as a sort of concept of change. Um, we put in place, we had an ambulance that was on standby 24 hours for a month. At a, at a cost to the organisation of nearly £700 a day, just sat there. He did one transfer in the entire month, and that's with somebody who wasn't on the enhanced care pathway who had had a DVT. So we put everything that the anaesthetists wanted in place. And once they saw that it worked, they had a big meeting, they had a breakdown of it, they, had, they did a big audit. Once they saw that it worked, they actually bought in. And now they've extended it into all the other surgical specialties. There was, again, a lot of concern right at the onset. Oh, we've been doing spinals for anas uh, spinal anaesthesia for orthopaedics. We can't do spinal anaesthesia for upper GI cases. But they've done it. And now they're seeing that it's working. They're actually increasing the numbers. So it's about having champions and winning the hearts and minds, I think. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Steve, you come in and then Andy and then Loretta. <laughs> yeah, I would endorse that. It's undoubtedly getting the team approach. But when you look at the finances, then that becomes interesting because we look at saving days and how much money that will save or look at different um, post-operative programs, how much it will save. But all of this is labour intensive. You know, when you're optimising the patient beforehand, you have to invest in doing that. It takes time. When you look at, say, um, mobilising patients on the ward, you know, our day cases, they may get three visits to get them standing, walking and going up and down stairs during that, that afternoon. So 
to get an efficient program is not all just about saving money because you reduce the length of stay. You may have to put some money in to get the, the results at the other end. OK, thanks, Steve. Andy and then Loretta. Yeah, Tim, uh, and I, I think it sounds as if obviously colleagues in, in Wales and Northern Ireland are really challenged with regards to waiting time. So they're probably operating a lot of very deconditioned patients. There may be issues with sort of health inequalities, patients coming from higher areas of deprivation. I think what's you know really fantastic about the work that Steve and Paul have done is that um, you know South Warwick's obviously quite an affluent area. When they were supporting Coventry, um, you know, uh, coming out of COVID, actually they noticed that because the pathway is so good, actually the you know patients that came from slightly uh, more deprived you know areas with you know more deconditioned, uh, the length of stay wasn't affected. I mean, is that right, Paul and Steve? Have I got that correct? Yeah. So oh. so we've pretty much done most of Warwick now. So we've taken on Coventry and the Oxfordshire borders, and we've actually done eighty cases for the Y Valley Trust in the past two months. Uh, in the past six months, sorry. In the past two weeks, Steve did two bilateral cases for Y Valley patients who'd waited over 60 weeks. And that was purely a case that they could barely walk in the pre-op area when we assessed them. So I think sort of touching on all those points, um, it, it, if you've got a good robust system in place, it doesn't take a lot to adjust it for the length of stay that patients have had, although it is a very valid point that Patients are mentally, physically more deconditioned at present. Um, OK, OK, thanks. Yeah. So Loretta and then Gethin and then I will we'll wind up. Loretta. Yes, thanks for all the presentations. They've been absolutely fabulous. And what comes across so strongly is clear leadership, working together, the teamwork is, is, is really important and the patient involvement and the pathway every stage. Did it impact on morale and, and retention and recruitment? You know, as you got better at it, did, did, was that a byproduct of all the team working and, and how you did this together as teams? So who wants to have that? Steve and uh, Paul first? Yeah, well, I, I would certainly think that the um, the whole morale of the, of the team goes up as you see success. Yeah. Um, and I and people thrive on that, don't they? They yes. love to see, you know, happy patients, happy work, better in work. It, it would be wrong to say things are perfect, you know. That mm. would that's a step too far. But I think in terms of getting getting the staff on board, it's 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 been a, a sort of pleasure in seeing the success. Um, so yeah, I think I think you're right. Yeah. And Loretta, the, all the data we've got from the hot cold science bits we did before COVID, and now people getting back to more normalised working shows that people want to do the job, they want to do it well. And we've absolutely. got the data that shows that morale improves absolutely. And everybody loves going to work, doing a good day's work, don't they? And with great outcomes. Indeed. And I think that's what came across. And, and mm. we we do have a retention issue within Wales, particularly in our theatres. Um, and it is just that absolute team approach to this is the thing that will make the difference in good yeah. clinical leadership at all stages. So thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Gethin, as always, you've got the last question. <laughs> oh, Tim, you spoil me. Um, so, I, I, so, firstly, massive thanks. Really, um, really, really inspiring and um, and, and great. Uh, I, I, one question, uh, Tim, for you, which is, can we share, I know we've recorded today, can we share the yep. actual presentation, you know, the, yep. not just, you know, the, the videos as well? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've, I've been winding up some of my orthopaedic leads whilst uh, sending them little pictures, so that's been great. Um, I guess I guess the one the one question and and, and Andrew you touched on it uh, as as did Stephen, which is you know our, our poor patients have waited years um, for surgery and and you know I think I think one of the bits that we need to do, you know certainly within my health board but 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 probably across most of Wales is is prehabilitation because our patients just are not optimised and 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 I guess it's just what it, what what models people have got for prehabilitation. Um, so that we we really stand, you know, it, it's not necessarily about the money. It's far more about getting the right outcome and the best treatment for the patient. And if if I can do that with fewer beds, there's greater likelihood of them getting treated. Okay, Andy, answer. Yeah, I was going to say I think that um, you know the work that um, you know Chris Snowden and, and Mike Swart have done, you know, with the perioperative medicine data set is absolutely you know brilliant. So I suppose if they could 
you know, get those sort of data packs um, and, um, you know, maybe organise some visits to, you know, Wales to Gethin and his colleagues and obviously linking with anaesthetic colleagues as well, because, yeah, Gethin, they've done some brilliant, you know, work. Actually, they've got some really good, you know, data benchmarking, you know, uh, trusts across the, the country and, and systems. OK, so thanks for that, Andy, and um, we're happy to share all that, Gethin. Don't, uh, but I think for what, what I take away is, you can see leadership is critical and there's more ways to do and get a result. And I think you've seen different ways of doing that. And I think that what we've got now in, in Wales and Northern Ireland is we really have now got the beginnings of development of hub sites. And I think in Wales, we'll certainly have six out of seven health boards with hubs, which Gethin, I don't really even thought was remotely possible a year ago. And I think it's really, really encouraging. But my, my real plea is, when you get these up and running, you already need to have embraced everything you've heard today. So you need to go on your visits. You need to go and see these places, get them even, even in, get them to come down and see what you're doing, what you're planning to do and get their advice. They're really good clinicians who want to impart what they've learnt to everybody else for the benefit of patients. So that when these hubs really get going, they're going to go at top decile, best in class to make, you know, the elective orthopaedic service in Wales absolutely world class and world beating and the same in Northern Ireland. So I think there is real opportunity from tonight to rethink how your hub's going to run. And when we talk today, getting about number of beds you need, you can see how the bed base changes based on the length of stay and what have you, given the given the nuance of deconditions patients waiting a long time. But once you get over that hump and you're doing your efficiency and productivity, you can see how in the medium term you're going to bring that down, can't you? Brilliant. OK, so can I just thank everybody, uh, the speakers, all fantastic, you for attending. We'll share the transcript and we'll share the slide deck and have a very good evening. So thank you. you too. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Tim. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, all. Bye. <clears throat>